So if you think about it, um, this selective adaptation is a really cool way to study uh, neurons that are involved in uh, detecting certain patterns. All you do is you expose that pattern to the retina for a really long time to adapt those neurons uh, inside the brain and then you see what happens right see what happens when you've adapted them and they fired uh, a lot and they've decreased their activity um, so normally in these in this uh, little triad that we've seen before right a stimuli uh, a person can judge your taste of the bars right so they see uh, what direction bars are oriented they can see them right uh, and suppose, uh, presumably the way we do this is uh, whenever that stimulus hits our retina, travels through the pathway into our uh, cortex, the right complex cells are um, activated so that uh, we're able to judge where the bar is oriented. Um, if we do selective adaptation by exposing you to those same bars for a very long time, eventually you're going to uh, you're not going to you're going to do a much worse job at detecting the orientation because the cells, the complex cells that um, mediate the detection of those bar orientations are going to be worn out from being fired too much. Uh, you can also eliminate the orientation detectors uh, by selective rearing. Uh, by say for example rearing um, uh, if you were raised in an environment that had nothing uh, but uh, uh, vertical bars in it um, that would disrupt your ability to detect uh, those vertical bars um, so this gives us like I said this gives us a great way to measure the sensitivity uh, of one stimulus characteristic so we use selective adaptation to um, um, affect one specific characteristic such as detecting bars oriented a certain way. Um, so basically what we do is we check to see, uh, we do a, a study to see how well uh, you can detect a certain characteristic, for example what direction bars oriented, and then we expose you to those bars for a very long time. Uh, to adapt the uh, neurons that are responsible for enabling us to perceive those bars and then after we've exposed you we've adapted those neurons for a long period of time then we measure the sensitivity again to see how well you're able to detect uh, that particular stimulus right so here's an example right uh, you know we measure the con we measure your ability to see uh, differences in contrast at different orientations. Um, if you remember, we're really good uh, when the orientations are up and down or uh, side to side, uh, horizontal, uh, and we're not so good when the uh, the grates are, are oriented at a certain degree. But we go ahead and we measure your or your ability to detect uh, differences in contrast uh, at different orientations, and then we adapt you to one high contrast grading. So we adapt you to this here, and basically we just have you stare at that for a very long time. After you've done that, we do this measure again, and what's going to happen is that you're going to be a lot worse at detecting the contrast here in the middle one because we've adapted those court those uh, feature detectors the the uh, complex cortical cells that are responsible for helping us to detect this orientation because we we essentially wore out the receptors by having you stare at this um, uh, stimulus for a very long time um, usually in this in these types of studies uh, the gratings those black and white uh, stripes are used as a stimulus um, and we can adjust the intensity between the light and the dark squares to see how well you're able to detect contrast. Um, so for, here's an example going from a very high contrast stimulus all the way to a very low contrast stimulus. Um, so we keep decreasing the intensity until you can just barely see the grate, right? So if you go back here, we keep decreasing it until finally these bars sort of fade into each other, right? And we just uh, basically contract, uh, calculate the sensitivity by, by taking the reciprocal of the threshold, right? So 1 divided by uh, whatever the threshold was that you, um, that you responded to.
Uh, if the threshold is very low, it means that you have very high contrast sensitivity. In other words, it doesn't take very much uh, to activate your uh, feature detectors to detect the, the, uh, the contrast. So low threshold means a very high contrast sensitivity. Um, so, for example, here, what we're going to, uh, uh, one of the things you see here uh, is this uh, um, um, great uh, orientation tuning curves, right? Uh, so here is the orientation at vertical, zero degrees, up and down, right? And then as we uh, orient the bars more and more to 20 degrees and then 40 degrees, right, you'll notice that the or that the our contrast threshold goes down. In other words, we're less and less able to detect changes in contrast, right? Um, sure enough, when you look at the um, uh, firing of um, cortical cells firing of cortical cells, uh, you'll notice that the curves, uh, and this, this diagram is in um, uh, this diagram is on page 68, right? So uh, you'll notice that um, uh, in this experiment, right, uh, uh, the, you know, we, we did selective adaptation, right? So, and uh, after we did the selective adaptation, we did the orientating where we started rotating the thing. You notice very quickly we get this very in impressive decrease in um, the ability to detect uh, differences in contrast, right? So the contrast threshold is very high here, which means we can see differences, but it goes away pretty quick. And what's really cool is that this curve and this is from you know basically having people report to us when they're able to uh, see the disappearance of the grates. The really neat thing about that is this curve matches this curve here. This is the psychophysical curve, where we are matching, uh, where we are looking at, at uh, um, stimulating, uh, uh, looking at the firing rate, I should say, of of, of uh, cells as a bar, a grate is being oriented, right? And we see almost the, exactly the same curve, right? So these cells fire off and uh, very high when the grate is vertical and the firing drops off as the, uh, of these particular cortical cells, the firing drops off as the grate is oriented either to negative 20 degrees or positive uh, 20 degrees. Um, the fact that these these two curves look almost the same suggests that uh, it's probably these cells that are mediating this uh, this effect. Um, another set of experiments are selective rearing experiments where you take animals um, and for example uh, they'll take kittens and raise them in an environment that is only made up of vertical bars, right? Uh, and what will happen is uh if you look at the brains of these animals uh after they you know after they've matured you'll notice that the neurons that detect say vertical bars or if they're reared in a in a in an environment that only has uh a horizontal bars you'll notice that the neurons get much uh the, the neurons in their cortexes in their cortices uh predominate there's much more of them than in a normal animal right uh, so Blakemore and Cooper did a, a groundbreaking study where they raised kittens in tubes, in big giant tubes that had either horizontal, uh, horizontal or vertical lines, right? Uh, and it and they noted that the kittens responded uh, very positively or differently to the types of lines they were reared in. So uh, whenever you exposed a kitten that was raised in horizontal environment to horizontal lines, they were able to perceive those, but they didn't do such a good job of perceiving the uh, vertical lines. So here's the way uh, the experiment worked, right? Um, you would have uh, this kitten raised in these tubes, right, with these either horizontal or vertical lines. And um, you would have, uh, for example, this cat here, was raised in uh, a tube that uh, only had vertical lines, right? The lines going up and down. And sure enough, 
if you were to find a cell, um, if you were to find uh, one of their neurons, or a lot of their neurons, I should say, had this firing pattern here where they would fire very strongly when lines are oriented uh, along some vertical, but whenever the line started getting horizontal, uh, the neuron would stop firing. And similarly, if you had a horizontally reared cat, a cat that was reared and only in a, a tube that had horizontal lines, uh, most of the neurons uh, in that cat's cortex would not fire when it was exposed to vertical lines, but would start firing like crazy when it's exposed to, uh, to horizontal lines, right? Um, there are higher level neurons that allow us to detect more sophisticated features. So we have the inferotemporal cortex, right? Uh, the IT cortex, right? Which is known, which we <laughs> call the IT cortex, right? Um, the IT cortex, um, is, has, a, has been looked at uh, particularly in monkeys because it has a, it has a, a lot of different complex feature detectors um, there's a in your book I'm looking for this reference and here it is right here it's on page um, 69 research done by a psychologist named Charles Gross looking at the um, uh, looking at the IT cortex of monkeys and basically they found that monkeys were able um, the the cortex this cortex is part of the this part of the cortex and let me see if there's a picture yeah here it is right here so in the monkey brain this is the IT cortex right here and this is actually a monkey brain it's not a human brain it's a monkey brain right and that's where the IT cortex is. This is the side of the monkey brain. The the uh, so the monkeys actually look uh, uh, kind of looking off to the side like this. This is the side of their head. Their eyes are going to be here. This is the back of their head. This is the top of their head. And this is just the side of the brain. And the IT cortex is located right there. Um, it turns out the IT cortex has a, a feature detectors for a lot of different things. And if you look in your book on page, uh, let me see if it's in here, a slide. Yeah, here it is. Um, these slides here uh, um, show some of the shapes that Gross and his team showed to the monkeys. And, for example, there were, there were uh, cells that fired with a closed hand, cells that fired with an open hand. Uh, cells that fired with bent fingers. Um, very interesting that they were able to find these very specific cells that only fire to these particular um, image. Uh, in the human brain, we have the fusiform area, the fusiform face area. It's called in your book the FFA. Uh, this this area seems to be really really important in humans. And this is a picture of a human brain. It's the bottom of the brain. So you're basically looking looking uh, at, at at the bottom, an uh, upside down brain. Uh, this is the front, this is the back of the head here, the front, the eyeballs would be here and here. Um, this is the brain stem right here, um, the cerebellum, right? And the fusiform area is kind of underneath the um, temporal lobe here. And the fusiform area seems to be really important in helping us to identify faces. Uh, there's, as a matter of fact, there's this disorder, and I can never pronounce this word. <laughs> Uh, prosopagnosia, prosopagnosia. Um, <laughs> that's the inability to detect faces or to identify, um, uh, unable to recognize faces, right? I mean, you can like perceive it, right? But you don't recognize it as a face, right? Uh, and you will get that if you have damage to this area, like say, for example, from a stroke. Um, one of the interesting bits of uh, I guess theorizing with regard to how uh, we're able to perceive objects more complex objects right is this idea of a sensory code right so maybe you know there's you know how are we able to detect objects in our environment right maybe there's this um, you know maybe there's this um, um, uh, hang on a sec. Okay, maybe there's this uh, set of uh, uh, um, neurons, right? Um, 
that only respond when we see one thing. So this uh, led many years ago to this idea of a grandmother cell where, um, you know, your uh, uh, the cell sits there and it waits for the the right combination of sensory fi of neural firing that indicates that you're looking at your grandmother and then it'll fire and that's what tells your consciousness or your perception that hey this is your grandmother right <laughs> that's probably not the case we probably don't have a like a grandmother cell or cells like that but uh, uh, oddly enough we do have um, cells that respond to different concepts right so I can actually show you a picture of say Halle Berry or another person that you know and we can find cells in your hippocampal area that will resp in the hippocampus that will respond only to those particular concepts right the problem you know with this idea of having specific circuits or cells dedicated to a stimulus is that um, you know, think about the incredible number of stimuli we have to code in our environment. That's a lot of that's a lot of you know that's a lot of stuff, right? And the and the fact of the matter is, whenever you record from a particular cell, it turns out that cell always responds to more than one stimulus, right? So it's it's very likely that the firing of the way the the relationship between the firing of neural patterns and our perception probably involves lots of different neurons firing together in in specific patterns right so uh, and this would allow for a lot of different stimuli to be encoded by only a few neurons right so I mean you know take a simple example if you only have 10 neurons and you have uh, you have them fire in different patterns uh, you know, one neuron, two neurons, three neurons firing on and off. Uh, you could actually make a very large number of different combinations with just those ten neurons. Now imagine multiplying that by billions and you'll see that our brains probably uh, have that ability, right? So, you know, this is kind of the idea behind the grandmother cell, right? So you'll have like cell number ten, right? You know, imagine those ten neurons, right? <laughs> Uh, and then you see, you know, see this guy named Bill and that, oh, that, you know, cell number four recognizes all the different patterns of firing that are, that happen when you see Bill. So it fires off when you see Bill. And then you have another cell that only responds when uh, it sees all the patterns associated with Mary. So it fires and another one for, for some other dude, right? Um, so one of the questions you want to ask yourself, you know, as, as we're going through this process of trying to understand uh, how sensory information is encoded is, you know, how many neurons does it take uh, in this distributed model? You know, so we have if we have all these neurons firing across uh, distributed across our brain that are firing that allow us to perceive objects, how many does it take? Right. Um, well, one of the ideas behind uh, this is this sparse coding idea that only if a small number of neurons are needed, right? And this kind of goes back to this most parsimonious explanation. We figure that from an evolutionary perspective, it probably makes sense that our brains are going to use as few neurons as possible to be able to encode uh, an object, right? Um, so, and it's pro and this is a probably a, a good perspective to take because it's it's kind of the the uh, compromise between this specific model like a grandmother cell and this massive distributed coding model where we say that every every cell is sort of involved in in uh, in helping us to uh, perceive objects, right? So it's probably something in the middle, right? Where it's not all of them, but it's not just one, right? One grandmother cell, it's some middle middle number of cells that's responsible for encoding and en enabling us to perceive uh, sensory stimuli. Whoops. Right. So, you know, in the um, whoops. So in the distributed coding model, right? All of the uh, you know, so Bill would uh, uh, cause this firing pattern among the cells. Mary would cause this particular pattern, and Raphael would cause this particular pattern. Uh, in the sparse coding model, uh, we're not using all the cells, right? So if you go back here, right, if you go back to the grandmother cell, we're using one cell, right, to say, hey, I saw Bill. And in the distributed coding model, we're using all the cells to fire in a particular pattern. 
Um, more, more than likely it's probably this combination, this sparse coding where not all the cells are being used, right? So in this sparse coding it's going to be maybe two and four and seven that fire off when they see Bill and Mary's four, six, and seven, right? It's probably going to be something like this, right? Which is kind of a cross between the grandmother cell model and the uh, distributed coding model. Uh, we do in fact have um, cells that respond to very particular patterns uh, to, to particular people, right? So in this example here, and this is from your book from page um, 72, right? If we go to page 72, this is a neuron that was recorded from the temporal lobe, right? Um, and so somebody, you know, had, you know, somebody had their neuron um, recorded, right? Probably somebody during a surgery for like epilepsy or something like that. Um, a lot of times when these patients are being uh, 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 put under for brain surgery, uh, a researcher will ask if they can stimulate and look at uh, uh, the behavior of some of their neurons. So what they did was they uh, uh, found a neuron that responded to Steve Carell, you know, who's a really funny guy, and uh, but it didn't respond to Bill Clinton or to, uh, what's her face here? I can't remember what her name is. Um... <laughs> This is a huge issue, right? Um, this is like this is pr this is the most challenging, most difficult problem in psychology. How does the physiology? How does all this neural firing in our heads get turned into perception, right? Um, more specifically, how does all this firing in our head get turned into consciousness, right? This awareness of what we're doing and what we are, right? And typically the problem of consciousness has been broken up into two uh, categories, the easy problem and the hard problem of consciousness, right? So basically what we're saying is, okay, for the easy problem, let's see um, what sorts of uh, physiology, what sorts of neural firing in our brains correlate with our experience. And that's kind of what we're doing, you know, what we did here with this Steve Carell thing, right? You know, we found neurons, we found a firing, this physiological firing of neurons that correlated with um, uh, our experience of a particular person's face, right? And, you know, that's not hard to do. That's within our current uh, state of the art right now but ultimately we we want to tackle the hard problem of consciousness right so how does the physiological responses of our nervous system cause our experience right so if you think of your you know your experience right now what you're doing listening to this lecture how does your how does your brain add up everything all of the sensations that you're getting and cause you, you know you whatever you is right to experience what's going on uh, to me in my opinion that is the number one toughest problem of psychology right now right so you know we get to the easy problem right we see neurons firing then we see this correlation with Susan's face and this correlation you know uh, uh, you know, with the color red because she's wearing a, a red sweater, right? That's easy, right? I mean, well, it's not easy, but it's within our state of the art, right? We can find cells that fire whenever we see somebody's face and whenever we see the color red, right? Or whenever we say we, we say the color red because she's wearing a red uh, sweater. You know, the hard problem is is really, you know, how does this, you know, how do we go from the flow of ions, the firing of cells, all the way to the experience, right? How does that cause, right? How does all that activity lead to the perceptions that you're seeing, right? How does that lead to, wh where, where does that come from? That's the, t that's the hard problem of consciousness right there.